The Oklahoma City Thunder are currently in the process of one of, if not the greatest tank job in NBA history. But tanking in the NBA isn't new. Teams like the 1984 Rockets and the 1998 Spurs have tanked before to get a chance at a great player in the draft. But, with that being said, during the 2010s, the Philadelphia 76ers took tanking to a whole new level. Welcome to my mini-series on the Process Sixers, the current Thunder, and tanking in the NBA. May 10th, 2013. After a decade of mediocrity, the Philadelphia 76ers hire Sam, Hig Sam Hinkie as their new president of basketball operations. The goal for Hinkie and the Sixers is to win a championship. The problem? The Sixers are average and have no superstar. The Sixers are coming off a season where they had finished with a 34 and 48 record. Their best player is Drew Holiday, who averaged 18 points and 8 assists. A good player, but probably not a future superstar. The rest of the roster is pretty mediocre. There are a couple of young guys like Thad Young and Evan Turner, some vet vets like Jason Richardson, but no super, no future superstar. Now, I keep mentioning that the Sixers didn't have a future superstar, and here's why. As I said, Hinkie's goal was to win a championship. And in the NBA, to win a championship, you almost need one or two superstars. In the NBA, there are three ways to acquire any player or a superstar player. The first is in free agency. For this, you need three things. A superstar's contract to be up, cap space, or the ability to create cap space, and crucially, the superstar needs to want to play for you. Given the fact that, Sid that Philly isn't a major, f a major free agent destination, and that superstars usually don't want to join average teams, this option seemed difficult and out of the Sixers' control. The second way to acquire a player is via trade. This is certainly a viable option for any NBA team looking to acquire role players or round out the roster, but is much harder for superstars. Teams are, will are rarely willing to trade a superstar, and if they do, the package in, in return must be of equivalent or near equivalent value. Assets the Sixers just didn't have or couldn't give up while staying while still putting a competent team around their recently acquired player. That leaves the third and final way, through the NBA draft. This is a good way to acquire talent, but most superstars are picked at or near the top of the draft. You need to be a bad team to get a top pick. Finally, if you get the number one pick, the draft class needs to have a player with superstar potential. So, with only one pick in every draft, the odds of getting a player with superstar potential are still not great. The way to combat these odds is to have multiple picks in multiple drafts to find that franchise player. So, the process begins with the goal of getting as many draft picks in as many possible drafts to find a superstar and to win a championship. To start the process, the Sixers would trade their best player Drew Holiday to the Pelicans for the sixth pick in the draft, Nerlens Noel, and a 2014 first first round pick. They would also draft Michael Carter Williams 13th overall with their own pick. They would also hire Brett Brown as coach. During the 2013-14 season, the Sixers also traded away Evan Turner and Spencer Hawes and acquired three additional second round picks. They finished with a poor 19 and 60, 63 record, but Michael Carter Williams won Rookie of the Year and they did have four picks in what seemed what was seen as a loaded 2014 draft. With the third overall pick, the Sixers would draft dominant Kansas center Joel Embiid, who only fell to them due to injuries. Then, with the 10th overall pick, they would draft Alfred Payton, who they'd immediately trade for the 12th pick, Dario Saric, and a future second round pick. Saric, who would stay in Europe until the 2016-17 season, may be a smart, smart move given the Sixers' ambition to keep tanking, in the second round, the Sixers picked KJ McDaniels at 32 and Jeremy Grant at 38. The Sixers committed to the process by further by trading Thaddeus Young to the Timberwolves for a Cavs 2016 first round pick. By the 2014-15 season, the process was in full force. The Sixers played 25 guys and Embiid wasn't even one of them, as he was out for the whole season with an injury. One positive, one positive of playing so many guys and Hinkie's advanced analytics is that you find diamonds in the roughs. In the 2014-15 season, the Sixers uncovered 3 and D wing Robert Covington, 
who shot 37% from three and averaged 13 and a half points per game. Also during the season, the Sixers decided to trade reigning rookie of the year Michael Carter Williams as they decided he was more empty stats than future superstar. They traded him, traded him to the Bucks for a future Lakers pick. The Sixers finished the season with an 18 and 63 record. Yet again, the Sixers ended up with the third overall pick. With that pick, they selected Jalil Okafor. He was recognized as the consensus best player available with his ability to score in the low post, but the fit was questions was questioned as the Sixers had already drafted Nerlens Noel and Joel Embiid in the past two drafts, both centers. The Sixers would also select Rashad Holmes and Willie Hernan Gomez in the second round. The Sixers would also engage in a multiplayer trade with the Kings, where they would receive a 2018 first round pick. The 2015-16 season is probably peak process. Rookie Jalil Okafor averaged 17.5 points and 17 rebounds, but got into two street fights in Boston. The Sixers started the season 0-18. Brett Brown would get their coach would get an extension despite the team being 1-22. The Sixers would finish the season with a record of 10-72, and, and Sam Hinkie was forced to resign. The Sixers would receive the number one overall pick in the 2016 NBA Draft and would take 6'10 athletic playmaker Ben Simmons, a hype prospect and someone's, someone with clear superstar potential. Unfortunately, he got injured and didn't play a single game in the 2016-17 season. The Sixers also s selected Timothy Luawu Cabrero and Furkan Korkmaz later in the first round. The Sixers also traded Jeremy Grant to the Oklahoma City Thunder for a 2020 first round pick. At the trade deadline, the Sixers would trade Nerlens Noel to the Mavericks for a conditional first round pick. Also in the 2016-17 season, Dario Saric and Joel Embiid made their debuts, with Embiid impressing in his 31 games played, averaging 20 points, 18 rebounds and 2.5 blocks in only 25 minutes a game, and almost winning Rookie of the Year despite the number of games played. The F Sixers would finish with a 28-54 and record and received the third overall pick in the NBA Draft. The Sixers would then trade the third overall pick in the 2017 NBA Draft and a future first round pick to the Celtics in exchange for the first overall pick in the 2017 Draft. With their second number one overall pick in a row, the Sixers would select Mark Fultz out of Washington, an athletic 6'4 guard with the presumed ability to dribble, pass, and shoot. The Sixers would also sign J.J. Redick in free agency, an excellent shooter and fit around their roster. The 2017-18 season brought success for the Sixers. Simmons and Embiid were mostly healthy and excelled. Embiid averaging 23-11 was named an All-Star and Simmons averaging 16-8-8 as he controversially won Rookie of the Year over Donovan Mitchell. The Sixers also put a great lineup around them. The Simmons, Redick, Covington, Sarge, and Bead starting lineup had a great mix of shooting and defense and was very good. The Sixers won 52 games and were the third seed in the East. On the negative side though, number one overall pick Mark Fultz was a disaster. He played only 14 games, had multiple injuries, and forgot how to shoot a basketball. The situation is still unclear, complicated, and hard to explain. Back to the Sixers. In the first round of the playoffs, they would beat the Miami Heat in five games. In the second round, the Sixers would lose to the Celtics in five games, though. A disappointing loss given the fact that the Celtics were missing both Kyrie Irving and Gordon Hayward, and because Jason Tatum, the man the Celtics had selected with the third overall pick, Philly traded them, averaged 23 points a game in the series. With that being said, the 2017-18 season was a great year for the Sixers, especially after many years of tanking. In the 2018 draft, the Sixers would select Mikel Bridges with the 10th overall pick before trading him to the Suns for Zaire Smith and a 2021 Miami first round pick. The Sixers would also select sharpshooter Landry Shamit with the 26th overall pick. The Sixers would enter the 2018-19 season with a similar roster to the last season, but higher expectations. And 13 games into the season, they would add to those ex expectations by trading Robert Covington and Dario Saric, two starters, and a second round pick for disgruntled superstar Jimmy Butler, who was on an expiring contract. 
making the Sixers one of the favorites in an Easter conference that contained the Bucks, Raptors, and Celtics as competition. Then, at the trade deadline, the Sixers would make two more major moves. First of all, they would trade Wilson Chandler, Mike Muscala, and rookie Landry Shamet, who had impressed so far, two first round picks and two second round picks for borderline all star forward Tobias Harris, Boban Marjanovic, and Mike Scott, giving the Sixers a new starting lineup of Simmons, Reddick, Butler, Harris, and Embiid, and confirming their ambition to win now. They would also trade Markel Fultz, who continued to struggle with injuries, and his and trade him to the Orlando Magic for a first and second round pick. The trade would end the Markel Fultz saga, but also bring us to a time in the process where the Sixers will, that the Sixers will look back on with regret. To have the number three overall pick trade up and not even end up with a useful useful player has got to hurt. The Sixers would finish the season with a 51 and 31 record and were the three seed in the East. In the first round, they would play a young Brooklyn Nets team. After losing game one without Embiid, the Sixers would prove that they were the better team by winning the next four games to step to go to the second round where they had faced the Toronto Raptors. The Sixers would be able to split the two first two games in Toronto with two excellent Kawhi Leonard performances. Then the Sixers would beat the Raptors in game three at home giving them home court and a chance to go up 3-1. In Game 4, the Raptors would claw back as Kawhi scored 39 points, grabbed 14 rebounds, and hit multiple tough shots down the stretch. Then, the Raptors would blow the Sixers out at home in Game 5. The Sixers would respond by winning Game 6 and setting up a Game 7. Game 7 was a tight defensive battle. The game was very close down the stretch, 85-85 was less than 2 minutes left. From there, Kawhi would hit a very long two, and Lowry would come up with the steal, uh, putting the Raptors up by two. Then, the Sixers would respond with a sec succession of trips to the free throw line before Jimmy Butler would get a layup in transition off a missed free throw from Kawhi, tying the game at 90 and giving the Raptors the ball with 4.2 seconds left on the clock. I think we all know what happens next. Here, if you're Philly. It's off to Leonard, defended by Simmons. Is this the dagger? Oh! Kawhi Leonard caps off a 41 point performance with one of the craziest game winners of all time, sending Embiid and the Sixers home. The series was massively revealing for the Sixers and would have, massive, would have a massive impact. The first thing that stands out from the series are Embiid, Embiid's on-off numbers. The Sixers were a plus 90 with Embiid on the court, but a terrible one, minus 100 in the limited minutes he spent on the bench in the Raptors series. It was clear that that was a problem that the Sixers needed to address. Secondly, Ben Simmons was not very good in this series. Jimmy Butler took over the offense, as Simmons, who lacked any kind of jump shot, was reduced to standing in the dunker spot clogging the lane. He averaged 20 uh, he averaged 11.5 points and less than 5 assists per game. The Sixers would also have tough de decisions to make in free agency as the mo majority of the rosters roster including starters Jimmy Butler, Tobias Harris and JJ Redick were free agents. To start the crucial 2019 offseason, the Sixers would draft Ty, Ty Jerome before trading him for Matisse Thibel. In free agency, the first domino to fall for the Sixers was Jimmy Butler, who after feuding with Brett Brown and Ben Simmons was set on leaving for Miami. The problem was that Miami didn't have any cap space, so the two teams orchestrated a signing trade where the Sixers would get Josh Richardson in return. Richardson was a good defensive player coming off his best season where he had averaged 16.6 points per game. The problem that was that Richardson was an average to below average three point shooter meaning his fit with Simmons and Embiid wasn't great. Then, on June 10th, the Sixers would make two massive signings. First, they would re-sign Tobias Harris to a 5-year, $180 million contract, the 6th biggest in NBA history at the time. This was seen as a big overpay at the time, especially because Harris had never made an All-Star game. But, after losing Jimmy Butler, the Sixers couldn't afford to lose Harris. 
The second move may have been even more of an overpay, as the Sixers signed 33-year-old Al Horford to a four-year, $109 million contract. The reasoning for the Sixers was that Horford could play center when Embiid wasn't playing, and that he could play power forward alongside Embiid. But in, re in reality, Horford was aging, not a very good perimeter defender, something required for a power forward in the modern NBA, and didn't space the floor very well, as he is a low volume three-point shooter. The Sixers will also extend Ben Simmons in the 2019 offseason. Despite a questionable offseason, the Sixers still entered the 2019-20 season with high hopes. They were the second favorite to win the East as people thought they would be great defensively and have enough offensively to win a wide open East. The Sixers were disappointing in 2019-20. They were only the 8th best defensive team and the offense struggled. The lane was clogged, Josh Richardson and Al Horford both shot poorly. Embiid also only played 51 games and missed the All-NBA teams. Simmons stagnated offensively and didn't develop a shot. The Sixers would finish with a 43-30 and record, and were the sixth seed in the East. In the first round, the Sixers played without Ben Simmons and were swept by the Celtics. Even though the Sixers struggled with injuries, they still needed to make a major change. They started by firing Brett Brown, replacing him with Doc Rivers, then hired Darryl Morey to run the front office. On draft night, the Sixers would draft Tyrese Maxey, a guard out of Kentucky with the 21st pick. Then the Sixers would trade Josh Richardson for sharpshooter Seth Curry. This trade was looked at as a good trade for the Sixers as Curry was a good fit and was also on a multi-year deal. The Sixers would then sign Wa Dwight Howard filling the backup center role. Finally, they would trade Al Horford only one year after giving him a $109 million contract. To complete the transaction, the Sixers would have to give up a first round pick and in return would receive 3 and D role player Danny Green on an expiring contract. The Sixers looked good to start the 2020-21 season. The shooting of Curry and Green helped their spacing and motivated Embiid was playing at an MVP level. But there were still concerns. Simmons had regressed offensively, averaging only 14 points per game, and the lack of an elite perimeter shot creation raised the question about their ability to win in the playoffs. This is when an opportunity arose. James Harden, one of the league's best players and an incredible scorer, was unhappy and wanted to be traded. The C Sixers seemed like the perfect candidate. Daryl Morey was previously the Rockets GM and had already traded for Harden. Harden would fit well with Embiid and the rest of the roster and was precisely the player they needed. And the Sixers had, an, had the assets with a franchise player in Ben Simmons and young players and picks. So what happened? The Sixers were willing to trade Ben Simmons, but were not willing to add Maxi, Thibel, and multiple first round picks. So the Rockets would trade Harden to the Nets, one of the Sixers' biggest rivals. At the time, and looking back, I think most play people would agree that the Sixers should have gone all in and traded for Harden. The Sixers would move on and continue to play well, up to the, to the trade deadline, where an other, another opportunity would ar arise. This time for Kyle Lowry, and the asking price was much lower. But the Sixers' refusal to part ways with Maxi Thibel and draft picks hurt them again, as at the trade deadline, the Sixers passed on Lowry and traded for George Hill instead. As the reg regular season came to a close, despite Embiid missing games, the Sixers would finish with the number one seed in the East. Embiid would average 28.5 points per game and 10.5 rebounds, finishing second in MVP voting and establishing himself as one of the best players in the league. Ben Simmons would also finish second in Defensive Player of the Year voting. In the first round, the Sixers would beat the Washington Wizards in five games, moving on to face the Hawks in the second round. After losing game one, the Sixers would bounce back by winning games two and three. Then the Sixers would lose games four and five. Two bad losses, especially Game 5, as they were up 25 points. The Sixers would rally back to win Game 6, setting up a Game 7 at home, which they would go on to lose. The Hawks si series was really a disaster for Philly, as they were clearly the better team and should have won. The main story just has to be Ben Simmons' disastrous offensive performance, as he averaged less than 10 points per game and was a liability 
liability, making a, a terrible 33% of his 45 free throws. This brings us to the present day. The organization has no faith in Ben Simmons and is looking to trade him. Joel Embiid is 27 and in his prime. The Sixers no longer have extra draft picks or cap space and are yet to make the conference finals. So, has the process been a success? Well, that's a tough question. The Sixers tore down and acquired picks very effectively, but that's the easy part. Over the years of the process, this is where the Sixers have picked. 11th, 10th, 3rd, 3rd, 1st, 1st. And they have Embiid and Simmons to show for it. Two players that they probably wouldn't have been able to get otherwise. But misses on Okafor and Fultz really hurt. And if they had been able to hit on those picks, they would be in a better position today. In the trade market, I think they've done okay. The Butler and Harris trades don't look great in retrospect, but they went all in and had a legit chance to win it all. If Kawhi shot bounces out, maybe the Sixers win an OT. In the conference final, they matched up very well versus the Bucks, and maybe they could have beaten them. And in the finals, maybe they could have beat an injured Warriors team. I think they definitely made a mistake in not trading for Harden or Lowry though. The Simmons and Embiid fit has not been ideal for years, and getting Harden would have given them a better chance to win it all this year. Finally, we get to free agency, and this is where the Sixers haven't been great, especially in the 2019 offseason, where they lost Butler and Reddick and overpaid Tobias Harris and Al Horford, setting them back at least a year. So, to answer the question, no, I do not believe the process has been a success so far. Hinky was brought in to win a championship, and since his departure, the Sixers haven't delivered one. They still have Embiid in his prime, but if I were to ask you if the Sixers are going to win a championship in the next five years, you'd probably say no. Thank you for watching this video. Please consider leaving a like and subscribe to this channel for more NBA content like this, and I'll see you guys next time.